All right. Welcome to the California Desert Coalition's fourth workshop, our second webinar, Election 2020, What It Means for Public Lands and Conservation. This webinar is being recorded. Hopefully some of you have attended our September webinar impacting local decision making. If you missed it, you can watch the recording on our website uh, workshops page. And if this is your first workshop with us, we hope you will come back for more. A few reminders about using Zoom. Please take a moment to locate the mute chat and raise hand features. Mute when you're not speaking to avoid noise or feedback. Um, you can register a chat in the, or a, que a question or comment in the chat box at any time and we will be monitoring that. And during the audience Q&A at the end of the speaker discussion, please use the raised hand feature so we can manage your participation. You should be able to find these at the bottom of your Zoom window in the menu bar. If it hides itself, you may have to click in the window or move your cursor around. For those of you who are not familiar with us, the California Desert Coalition is a nonpartisan 501c3 nonprofit committed to the protection and preservation of the Mojave Desert landscape. By preserving the landscape, we preserve the cultures and customs, ecosystems, economies, and the quality of life that bloom in the California desert. Some of the work we do includes building grassroots coalitions, educating and mentoring community members to participate in decision-making processes. We also develop and advocate for community-driven desert conscious policy and management. Please visit our new website to learn more about us, our projects, and our workshops. And follow us on Facebook at CA Desert Coalition. And of course, email us. And now I want to welcome our esteemed speakers, David Feynman, Mark Kramer, and Kim Delfino. Thank you very, very much for giving us your time and expertise tonight. We are very fortunate to have you. David was a legislative assistant in the House, US House of Representatives. He and I actually worked together back in 2007, 2008. He went on to build and lead the policy and advocacy efforts of several Jewish organizations in DC and on behalf of Holocaust victims internationally. He then joined Conservation Lands Foundation in I believe 2017, where he uh, has built their government affairs pr program to protect and conserve public lands as part of the national conservation lands. Mark spent a decade working in DC on natural resources and environmental policy, both in the White House and in the House of Representatives. He was a founding participant in both the California and the national Habitat Conservation Planning Coalitions. And for the past two decades, he has advocated for federal policy and funding for conservation of land and water in California and beyond in his role at the Nature Conservancy. And Kim has spent the last two decades as the California Program Director for Defenders of Wildlife. Based in Sacramento, she's been deeply involved in legislative battles at the state capitol and has worked closely with policymakers in state and federal government. She was a crucial force in the desert protection efforts like DRECP. And this year, Kim launched her own advocacy firm, Earth Advocacy, which provides policy and advocacy expertise to nonprofits and foundations with the goal of protecting and restoring our lands, waters, and wildlife for future generations. Congratulations and kudos, Kim. Before we dive into our discussion questions, I wanna set the stage just a bit. So Joe Biden is vice pres is president elect and living in a different time. And Kamala Harris is our vice president elect, our first female VP and former Senator from California. And in this screen, you can see the results of the election. Note that Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado, which are significant Western public lands states, uh, went for Biden. 
who has been outspoken in his intention to make the environment a priority. These states have typically been more conservative, um, but have been hurt by various Trump policies, including conservation rollbacks. And the politics in these states have been shifting somewhat notably over the last four years. It's interesting to pay attention to. The Senate is currently holding its Republican majority, but that does still hang in the balance. The two Georgia Senate seats are headed for a runoff on January 5th that could tip the majority for the Democrats. This is important because the majority party, of course, gets to determine the priorities and direction of the Senate and Senate committees. With a Democratic White House and House of Representatives, a Democratic majority in the Senate would effectively provide carte blanche for policy making. Conversely, if the Senate stays in Republican control, White House and House agendas will face challenges. Kelly's win in Arizona marks, get it, a significant shift in politics in that state. And in Colorado, Hickenlooper's win over conservative Cory Gardner, who supported Trump's public land policies. That's a key conservation win. Additionally, Harris's seat is now vacant and it will be filled by appointment of the governor uh, who will most certainly choose a Democrat. But one of the many things that remains to be seen with that is what role that person will take on public lands issues and how we could cultivate the new Senator as a thoughtful environmental champion. Democrats maintained the majority in the House of Representatives um, but lost seven seats and locally Raul Ruiz won his reelection in the 36th district, encompassing parts of Riverside County and the Low Desert. And Jay Obernolte won Paul Cook's former seat in the 8th district, which encompasses much of San Bernardino, Inyo, Mono counties, and the High Desert. Something that's interesting to note about um, Inyo County and California's 8th district. This is a crucial public lands district. And you see on the left, uh, what I've circled there, that kind of oddly long triangle-esque thing. That's the eighth congressional district, former Paul Cook, now it's Jay Obernolte. Um, it would seem the politics in that district are changing a bit. Pay attention to Inyo County on the other side where I've drawn this terrible arrow. And while the congressional district overall is conservative on the left, Inyo County leaned blue for Biden and a solid majority voted for Obernolte's Democratic opponent in this election. That's a shift compared to previous presidential election years in 2016, Trump versus Clinton. You can see Inyo County circled there, red. And in 2012, Obama versus Romney, also uh, Inyo County is red. And if we look back further, the results are the same. So surely there are many reasons for this shift in Inyo, but given the importance of public lands in the county, the environment was likely a strong priority. And we're seeing, again, public lands play an increasingly important role in some elections. It was pivotal in Senate races in Montana and Colorado, where voters chose pro-environment candidates. This may impact uh, Obernolte's leadership and priorities as a new House member and suggest that there may be more changes to come in the politics of the 8th District. Okay, great. So what? What does it all mean? Let's ask our speakers. Um, so I'm going to turn now to some questions that we have for our speakers. And the first one is for Mark. Mark, um, explain for us the conservation, natural resources, and climate priorities of the Biden administration. What can we expect will be the administration's first steps toward these goals in 2021. Okay, well, something we know for sure is that climate is gonna be a big priority. And we also know that uh, 
land and water conservation is going to be a big priority. The Biden team has said that uh, they're going to uh, return us to climate to, to the Paris Accord right off the bat. And they're going to make other changes that are within their power <clears throat> to emphasize uh, climate change and the need to address it. And that's a variety of ways, you know, clean energy uh, priority. This administration, the current one, has really emphasized fossil fuels, um, on, including on public lands, much more than uh, renewable energy. Um, they've also, you know, started off with. Um, you know, they've been fighting California on our Clean Air Act uh, prerogatives of having tighter standards than the rest of the country on auto emissions and things. That's all going to be changed very quickly. Um, the other thing that will happen is, you know, positions of the federal government in various lawsuits that have been filed will probably flip. So, you know, they'll stop fighting some, they'll start fighting others. Um, so that's, that's going to change very quickly. Executive orders will change with respect to climate to try and increase the influence of the federal government through its um, acquisition procurement processes to start to address climate change. So you're just going to see a, just a complete reversal of positions with respect to climate change. And anything that's been done with an executive order can be undone with an executive order. Anything that's been done through a formal rulemaking process there's, there's two paths there. One is if control of the Senate does flip, then there's the option of the Congressional Review Act, assuming that the Democrats remain more or less in lockstep. In the House, they only got a margin of four votes over the majority. Um, and in the Senate, it would be the vice president that would break the tie, uh, Vice President Harris at that point. Um, so if there's the the, the outcome in Georgia that gives Democrats a 50-50 slot, they uh, uh, balance in the Senate, they take control because of the tie-breaking vote of the vice president. They could um, use the Congressional Review Act, which Congress used significantly at the beginning of the Trump administration to roll back a number of Obama-era regulations. And anything within a certain number of legislative days uh, before the end of the administration is vulnerable to that. So that'd be a really quick way to do it. It's a long shot for the Dems to take control of the Senate. And so I don't think that's the path that they're gonna get on a lot of this. Could happen, but one shouldn't count on it. Otherwise they have to go through a whole rulemaking process to undo the rules that were promulgated and you know, build the case and, and go ahead and, and do a notice and comment process. And they'll probably do that. Um, with respect to public lands, that's also going to be, again, largely a, a reversal. Um, you'll probably see instead of monuments being shrunk, uh, you'll see them expanded. You'll probably see uh, administrative action to restate, reinstate the two monuments in Utah that were dramatically shrunk. You'll probably see uh, administration change its position completely in the lawsuits that have been filed there. And so uh, we'll see a different approach to the um, Antiquities Act. And in fact, I would say too, given that the other key priority that we know about with respect to the Biden interior team is that they've, they've signed on, they've embraced this sort of worldwide movement toward uh, 30 by 2030, which is sort of a step toward the EO Wilson half earth concept and it's, they want 30% of your lands and waters conserved, 30% of lands, 30% of waters in a protected status by 2030. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's not clear. Um, you know, there's IUCN definitions that I think the global movement is using, but there's different ways it could be interpreted uh, in this country and even in different states. In the desert, um, it's going to probably focus on additional designations and also in holding acquisitions. And it may be that a lot of that effort is actually outside the desert because the underrepresented uh, ecotypes in California in particular are more grassland and oak savanna. So further north, not so much in the desert. 
but I believe that there will be activity in the desert. There'll be a, an effort to figure out what needs to be done to complete the conservation vision that's already been begun. I believe that DRECP is gonna be resolved uh, in a way that just embraces what the Obama administration produced with some tweaks to address some concerns that people have raised that are probably legitimate. Um, so I think DRCP is gonna be resolved. I think um, you might see some new Antiquities Act designations proposed and they usually work on them during the entire term and then pop them out you know, toward the end of uh, each term. That's been the practice. Um, so that might happen in the desert, that's a real possibility. I know people have talked about one up in the Amargosa area, um, including a lot of Inyo County. So the politics there might support that uh, now. Um, I think those are some of the main things that we might see uh, early on. Again, you know, if, if the Senate doesn't flip, then their main tools are gonna be executive actions. And so that'll be executive orders where that's possible and rulemakings, which take longer where that's necessary. And things like the Antiquities Act uh, designations. So I think those would be things we can count on and re-entering Paris right off the bat. Great, thank you. To our other speakers, does anybody want to add anything to that uh, pretty thorough overview? <laughs> I think what Mark said was very thorough. The only thing I'd add is we're we're hearing that there will probably be uh, an executive order basically declaring 30 by 30 to be the federal policy of the United States that would help inform everything Mark said, but would also help to inform how the federal agencies responsible for land management will operate. So, you know, that would set the course for whomever is appointed interior secretary, EPA administrator, uh, USDA, et cetera, to manage land with that in mind. So we'll, that might not be day one, but presumably within the first 100 days. The only thing I would just add in addition to all of that, and it's not as exciting or sexy, but that is um, trying to sort of put things back together again within agencies and departments. So like the BLM was largely uh, you know, eviscerated in some sense, um, moved out to Colorado. And so I think there's going to be a concerted effort to try to put back some of these agencies that were uh, vandalized, basically, put them back into, um, into shape so that they can actually carry out all of the work that uh, Mark just outlined. Yeah, that was going to be my second question later in the proceedings, but yes. <laughs> oh, we're sorry. Gonna... Did We're going to re question? reconstruct the deep state. That's there you go. You guys are covering a lot of ground already. Mark, you've covered um, my next question to you as well. So um, I do have one more thing to say about 30 sure. by 2030, and, and that is uh, less relevant in the desert, really, where there's not much opportunity uh, for working lands. I mean, there are cattle that are grazed out there, but um, I think it's going to be important for the administration and as well as the state administration to uh, do some outreach to the ag community to make sure they see this as an opportunity and not a threat. Otherwise, the politics could get really difficult, especially in a very closely divided Congress. So, uh, like I say, it's more relevant in the areas further north, you know, where you actually have large tracts of private grasslands that are grazed. Um, not quite sure if the working lands concept is going to be very relevant in the desert where retirement of grazing allotments is probably going to be part of the strategy. It's not a great place to grow cows. Um, it's too dry. But, um, but I just think that that'll be that, that, that content, the ability to more easily navigate the politics of retiring grazing allotments in the desert will be affected by how well the administration, both at the state and the federal level, navigate the politics of, of uh, 30 by 2030 elsewhere, where there are more uh, productive private grazing lands. And so I'm just, what happens there will affect what's possible in the desert, I think. Could be wrong. 
I've just seen the sabers rattling already and predictably, and it's important to directly engage with folks and ideally, um, you know, get them on board because it could be a great opportunity if it's, if there's a role for working lands conservation envisioned. Okay, absolutely. Um, Kim or David, anything in particular you wanna to add to that point? Okay. Um, I do have to call a little bit of an audible here and ask David, um, before I go into your next planned question, um, but wanna check with you if you have anything that you wanna add in terms of um, climate change and the role that desert lands could play, uh, not just in California, but west, western wide um, protecting desert lands for, for carbon capture um, and as part of the, the uh, 30, 30 by 30 um, concept. I, but I know that you've worked a lot on this uh, at Conservation Lands Foundation. So do you wanna just speak to that a little bit? I mean, the way you characterize it is actually probably the best way to summarize it is that you need the desert lands in the Southwest United States and the BLM lands in the Southwest United States to reach 30% of land. So, you know, the land the desert in California is a huge part of that, but, you know, we'll be working with our grassroots partners throughout the West to make sure those landscapes become either part of the national conservation lands as specific units or generally given a protected status uh, to be able to get to that number, uh, but biologically to help with dealing with carbon capture. Thank you. Um, and the next question is for you. <laughs> so, David, the Senate will likely remain in Republican control and um, the House Democratic majority to get a little bit narrower, not too much. Um, but what do you think this means for decision making moving forward? Where do you see opportunities for bipartisan cooperation, perhaps? And where do you think divisions along party lines will persist? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually, the, the shrinking of the Democratic majority in the House, I think actually will have a pretty profound impact uh, because it'll shrink the size of the majorities on each committee. So, you know, the Senate, frankly, no matter how it works out with these two Georgia seats, you're going to have a very finely divided agenda. You know, it might be the Democrats maintain, you know, running that agenda versus the Republicans. But either way, a 50-50 Senate is going to be chaotic. Um, and in the House, you know, you're, you're going to have a House Natural Resources Committee that will be led by Chair Raul Grijalva and the Democrats. But at, I would guess they might have at most two seats more than the Republicans. So in many ways, in terms of how natural resources issues move through both committees and how the agendas of those committees align, it's going to be very similar to how it's been for the last few years. You're going to have the House Democrats passing as many bills as they can and sending them over to the Senate, where many of them will die. Um, and then you're going to have the Senate take up their own agenda, and they'll pass their own bills. And Maybe you'll see what we've seen in the last few years is, you know, another dingle act uh, where you have more than 100 individual conservation related bills that just get stacked on top of each other and leverage against each other. So everybody has a stake in it. Um, some would argue that historically, politically, that's actually when you get most of good things done. Sometimes when one party has full control, uh, you know, they either can't get out of their own way, which you could argue happened in the first two years of the Obama administration when they had a fully democratic Congress. So uh, I think there is a chance for bipartisan cooperation. I think what'll, what'll be interesting to see in the next couple of years is how the different bully pulpit of a democratic president has over the, the agendas of both uh, chambers. You obviously had to deal with a president for four years who, even though he would say he's the <laughs> greatest conservation president since Teddy Roosevelt is the exact opposite. But now you're going to have a president who's going to be demanding that Congress do things to address climate change. 
where I think in many ways the sweet spot might be for Republicans in the Senate and Democrats in the House is renewable energy. Um, because there's a number of bills that have moved in the House focused on renewable energy development. And in the Senate, uh, they've been trying forever to move an energy package. So I'm sure they're going to try that again under the leadership of the new chair of the committee, uh, Mr. Barrasso from Wyoming. So there may be an energy package that comes together that involves renewable energy developments, and that's something the president-elect has talked a lot about. And obviously that does impact the California desert. Um, one other point I just want to make relating to the, the new configuration of the Senate, both the chairman and the ranking member of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, Barrasso and Manchin, are from big coal states. So coal is going to have a lot of power. I find that quite ironic considering the outgoing president said he was going to save coal and didn't. And now you might actually have people in power who are are going to give coal a little bit of boost. But yeah, I think renewable energy and generally the concept of what energy looks like for the next 10 years is probably going to be the conveyor of, the, of legislation. And then you would tack on conservation to that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mark and Kim, anything to add? No, that was thorough. <laughs> I do think the narrow margins are going to make a, you know, a big difference. Yeah. 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 And I think, I guess the only thing I would just, is it, it tracks with the issue of filling Harris's seat is how much influence will California really have in natural resources policy? I mean, you have Jared Huffman on the house side in the fisheries uh, and fish and wildlife committee, which obviously <clears throat> he has, uh, you know, uh, he does, he's very progressive and um, he's been a real champion. Um, with the departure of Harris, if say, for example, Alex Padilla takes the, the place of um, Senator Harris, he, he does not really have a, a track record or an interest uh, in um, environmental issues. It's not, I'm not saying this as a criticism to him. I'm just saying like everybody has different areas that they're most interested in. And so Interestingly, if, if the, the, so we don't, we don't actually have anyone, if I'm not mistaken, David and Mark, please correct me, but I don't believe uh, California has a seat on um, ENR or Environment and Natural Resources and um, Environment and Public Works. Or public, You're right. Yeah. You're right. Um, and that's, that's actually really um, a big thing to think about because for many years, California had her presence on both those committees in the Senate. And in fact, Barbara Boxer led the Environment and Public Works Committee for many, many years. So California had a real influence and an ability to move policy beneficial to the state through those committees. And we don't have that anymore. So, you know, my hope is that it would be great to get a senator coming in from California who that is an interest of theirs and we're able to move policy that way. But, you know, I mean, we'll see. We'll see where we end up uh, with the governor. Say, for example, if Javier Becerra was picked, he's someone who has definitely demonstrated more interest and in, um, expertise in environmental issues than he may. I mean, I don't know if he'll pick one of those two committees, but, you know, that does it does influence California's ability to sway policy. Yeah, that's that's a really great point, Kim. Uh, I actually was just on a call recently with uh, Senator Harris's staff, uh, Ike, and he I hadn't thought about it this way, but he mentioned that California is the only Western state that doesn't have a seat on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, which is ridiculous. And he encouraged advocates to push whomever is appointed to that seat to seek a seat on that committee. It's the largest state other than Alaska, obviously, in that part of the world. And there should be somebody on that committee, and if not, on EPW for sure. So yeah, hopefully yes. they'll, they'll appoint somebody who has an interest in it and will seek it. Senator Harris was on EPW for a little while, but then she wanted judiciary. And uh, she was very active on judiciary, as you may have seen. And it worked out well. <laughs> it, did. it did, yes, it did. <laughs> yeah, we were joke, uh, their first couple of years, they didn't really decorate the office. Um, I mean, the first year or so, there were no pictures on the wall and the, people would comment that the last time they saw an office like that for that long was when Obama was in the Senate <laughs> for the same reason. 
Interesting. Um, yes, judiciary is a sexy committee for those on the call who um, are not as familiar with the inner workings of Washington, DC. Um, thank you guys, that was great. Um, Kim, the next question is for you. So let's talk a little bit about Jay Obernolte. This is a good segue because you were just talking about the importance of California's leadership in uh, Congress. So let's talk about Jay Obernolte, who won politics former district. He's a freshman member of Congress and um, freshman members tend to be cautious. They tend to spend a good part of their time staffing up, getting to know their new role, and they are hyper-focused on re-election. And remember folks, a member of uh, the House of Representatives is up for re-election every two years, which is not a lot of time. Um, so what do you think will be some of uh, Ober Nolte's early priorities? And what kind of approach should stakeholders engage, uh, take to engage him? So I would, I would, I wish I could say that the environment would be a priority, but I, I was perusing um, his scores from when he was in the state legislature, and they're fairly dismal. Um, CL, California League of Conservation Voters lifetime score for him is 10%, uh, and the Sierra Club gave him a 0% uh, this year, which is a drop from his um, massive 9% he had the year before. Um, <laughs> so. Um, CEHA, which is the California Environmental Justice Alliance, did give him a 21%. So, um, you know, obviously he may have voted. I think perhaps his interest uh, would be more. And I looked at some of his votes. He's voted more in the public health arena. Um, so it's really unclear where his public lands issues are. I actually searched around. The only thing I could find was that he teamed up in 2018 on an op-ed with Mr. Cook on healthy forests and fire. But unfortunately, it was it, it was pretty good. It was I mean, it was it wasn't like cut all the trees down and we're going to save ourselves from fire. But it, it it and it definitely advocated for more a partnership approach. So that was good. And and so I think that it's just not he's not one who prioritizes uh, the environment or public land. I mean, he's a businessman from Big Bear. He's really into small business protections, taxpayer. He's a fiscal conservative. Um, I would note, you know, Cadiz Water Project is within his district, and he has gone on the record in support of it. So that's not a good sign on the public lands uh, area. Um, but with that being said, um, you know, I think your Mariana, your note about uh, his district, uh, Mono was more blue, uh, Inyo was purple, and then the rest of it was more red. Perhaps, you know, given a, as a freshman. It, that and a cautious approach and looking at re-election, there may be some opportunities, uh, sort of low-hanging fruit where you can find um, popular projects that are supported widely, where he would be um, be, be supportive of things like that. Um, so, you know, I I think it in some ways it might be somewhat similar to working with Mr. Cook, uh, and well, you know, it is what it is. Uh, so I just you know. Uh, I, I think, and the other thing I think is he's going to need a lot of education. So if I were group folks, I would spend a lot of time getting him out on the land, uh, showing him projects uh, with a broad range of community supporters to show like that these are er these are projects that are not just supported by tree huggers. That there's a lot of people from a wide range of interests in the desert who care about these landscapes. Um, that's I would that's where I would be focusing my time with him. Because if he makes it past the, you know, the, the next election, you know, he could be in there for a while. And, um, and I think you really want to cultivate and educate him and um, hope that you can find some common ground where you can find it. And then, you know, if you don't, then pressure him when you can. Right. Yeah. Um, David, Mark? Yeah, I think that's spot on. Um, getting him out on the land. And I think to your point, Kim, about He's a small business owner. He cares about small business. Connecting the success of small business to public lands uh, as an economic driver, I think is a way to hopefully at least make him somewhat reasonable, may maybe in kind of the way that Mr. Cook has been the last few years. Um, and I know some groups are already engaging with him in that way, trying to make sure he sees it through that lens. So I, um, 
I think the fact that he only won the seat, I think by nine or 10% when Mr. Cook had won it by a lot more should be a signal to him. Now, obviously it was a very high turnout election and it, it, you know, there were down ballot results, I guess, from the presidential race, but yeah, I mean, he, it's, if the right center left Democrat ran in that seat, he'd be at risk. So I think he's going to have a, at least a selfish interest in the first couple of years to, to at least present himself as open to learning and understanding and maybe working in a bipartisan way with other uh, California delegation members on issues. So we should definitely approach him in that way and do it in a way that uh, creates relationships and not uh, antagonism and see what builds from there. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think local communities and local residents, actual constituents, are going to have the most influence there. So to the extent that the, you know various groups that maybe are more broadly based have relationships in the district, um, definitely build those coalitions. Um, I, I know that that worked really well earlier in the process on DRECP. Um, you know, MPCA in particular was very active in engaging some of the communities and the Eastern Mojave, and that that has an impact. So I think you know, embrace that that uh, small business angle and the economic development and ecotourism and all of that, and really, you know, focus on that. And I think that'll help. But early on, I mean, people build these relationships early in their tenure. Now he's been in the state legislature, but it's different when you're in Congress. So um, yeah, I would just really encourage people to engage mostly uh, in collaboration with uh, actual constituents in the district. Yeah, yeah, and I would just, I, would, I forgot to mention this, but I just note that in Inyo, his opponent actually carried Inyo. So, you know, Inyo did um, swing more Democrats, similar, I think, trending with Mono, um, Mono, Mono County. Um, so anyways, I just, I think, yeah, he's got to be careful. And so that gives um, folks working on these issues some opportunities. Great. Um, so we are quickly running out of time, but I do want to get a few more questions in before we turn to the audience Q&A. Um, and these have been really great and informative responses. Um, Mark, let's talk a little bit about staffing. Uh, we're going to see some major changes in leadership at the Department of Interior and Bureau of Land Management, White House Council of Environmental Quality, which has essentially been non-existent the last four years, EPA, Forest Service, et cetera. Um, if everybody mute, please. Somebody with a beautiful uh, crayon or watercolor drawing is not on mute. Can you please mute? I'll quick share my screen. <laughs> okay. Oh, you disabled screen sharing. So if you want me to share my screen, I got one slide. Yeah. How do I, uh, let me see, multiple participants can share something else. Did that help? Yes. Okay. It did. Great. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about staffing and what we might expect to see and, um, and how that's gonna impact uh, how the agencies move forward in the Biden administration. Okay, well, I, I won't take too long because you know a lot of this is speculative. But this is the transition team for Interior. And uh, out of this, I think there's a subset that's really leading the charge. Kevin Washburn is the team lead. Um, and pretty much all of these people have served in past administrations, mostly in the Obama administration, but some even earlier. And um, so what you're going to see is basically a, a return of savvy veterans, you know, people who know what they're doing, care about good government, can hit the ground running. And I think they're also gonna you know, re-empower the civil servants that are there. Um, and so I, I, I think that um, you'll see an effective group that will be able to get things done and implement the president's agenda, you know, the, the, the new president's agenda. So 
uh, and, and among other things, you know, Cadiz was brought up. Um, you know, that I think the, the current viability of that is based on uh, an internal document. I can't remember if it was a solicitor's opinion or if it was just a BLM policy memo, but it basically said that the railroad right of way uh, should be allowed to be used for a water pipeline because, you know, in the old days they had steam trains. So, you know, you might want water to, to uh, you know, fuel up your steam train. So, I, I, you know, it's a bit of a stretch. And I'm thinking that, you know, that's something that might be revisited. Uh, Brett Birdsong, who's listed third there, was the, the solicitor uh, focused on uh, land in the department. So, I, you know, anyway, I think that you've got people who are going to want a different set of priorities, reversing some of the things that have been happening in the last four years, and they're gonna know how to do it. So that's what you're gonna see. If you see people there you know, um, you know, maybe reach out to them. Uh, if you don't, know that you can work with folks from organizations with a DC presence that do know these people, and we can quickly uh, get to them eventually um, when the time comes. So that's my main pitch. Is that and then to add to what Kim said before, uh, you're going to see, I think, probably um, a reversal of maybe I don't know, but of the shift to try and move everybody in leadership out to Colorado. Uh, not everybody; they were going to move some of the key folks to Colorado and then spread others out in different states. Um, I think you'll probably see more of a, a core of leadership expertise. Uh, returning to or kept in DC, which the logic there is that they can coordinate with other agencies more easily and they can actually then coordinate with Capitol Hill more easily. Um, the logic of moving into the field was that they were closer to you know, their constituencies, um, but that facilitates you know, the captive agency syndrome where people basically just start um, serving the stakeholders that um, are most engaged in their issues, which are usually people who are engaged in economic activity, uh, resource extraction, et cetera. Um, so I think you'll probably see again, a, a shift of the center or retention of those who are still left in DC with more of a focus on interagency coordination and coordination with Congress. Great, thank you. Um, anything very quickly in about one minute that David or Kim, you wanna to add to that? I'll briefly add um, that I think you're going to see the administration seek significant increases in appropriations for restaffing of the agencies, particularly the Bureau of Land Management, but frankly, all of them have seen significant loss of talent. They need to be restocked. Uh, and so, you know, the administration will ask for money. And I can say on behalf of CLF, we will be urging Congress to fund Interior and BLM with more money to hire people and other groups should certainly sign on to those types of requests. Yeah, one other thing I'll say is you'd asked about, you know, rumors about BLM uh, and also the Park Service. So BLM, the rumor I've seen is uh, Steve Ellis, who was head of the Idaho office. And then for Park Service, the main one I've seen is uh, Cassius Cash, who runs uh, rock, I mean, Great Smoky Mountains uh, National Park. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you, David, for bringing up appropriations because that was a question I did not want to skip. Um, but again, we are running out of time. So um, thank you for that. And then there are two more questions that we, I just think we absolutely have to get to. Um, so I'm going to ask them both right now quickly. And one is for David and one is for Kim. <laughs> um, and we'll start with David and then we'll go to Kim. David, CLF was one of the many organizations uh, that helped secure the designations for Santa Snow, Mojave Trails, and Castle Mountains. Um, what do you think uh, is the future of the resource management plans that we in the desert have been waiting so long to work on. And then Kim, um, it's, it's been mentioned a few times in the conversation, 
tell us what what you think will happen next with DRECP that has we've also been in limbo um, around DRECP. So we'll start with David. We'll yeah. Um, well, I think the the answer to your question is appropriations, because you need staff to do resource management planning. So if if BLM it has more staff on hand anywhere, but particularly in California, there'll be more people to work on those plans. Um, but I can say from the, the external side, we'll be working with our grassroots partners to move forward with urging BLM uh, to go forward with those processes. And in some cases, even work on community alternatives or, you know, community guidance to help inform those resource management plan processes. Uh, but ultimately, if they're going to happen there or anywhere, it, it's going to rely on BLM having the staff resources to do it. So um, if you want your RMPs, we need money to do it. Indeed. Kim, tell us about DRECP, or if you have something to add to David's point as well. Well, I mean, on David's point, I think it also applies to DRECP, and that is there's implementation actions that were supposed to happen under the DRECP that didn't um, because funding was, a, was cut. And so um, I think where we're going to go with the DRECP is, fortunately, we won't be dealing with the plan amendment that had been threatened over the last four years or three years. And I think we're moving now into actually fully implementing the DRECP. Uh, Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan. And so that, that's a good thing, um, but there's a lot of work that was supposed to have happened under the implementation plan that didn't happen. And so we need to be looking at a bunch of uh, monitoring and evaluation work that should have been done. We need to be looking at the conservation management actions and do they need to be, uh, how are they being applied? Do they need to be adjusted? Um, the other thing, and this can kind of conflates with question that I think you weren't, aren't going to ask me, but I'm going to answer it anyway. But this is the intersection of the Biden priorities with what with the desert. And, you know, um, I think that one of the things that we have to be really careful with um, and is um, with the with the push for renewable energy, which is important. Obviously, we need to get turned to a clean energy transition. We must be reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, but we have to make sure we do not repeat the mistakes of the past, which is I do not want to be back in 2008 where we were looking at massive projects sort of being strewn across the landscape. And one of the fears or concerns that I have that I think we're going to need to be careful with is making sure that we are executing the desert plan, the desert renewable energy plan, where we're putting projects into the development focus areas that were already identified. And then if there's a push from asking for more, we really critically evaluate whether that is indeed something that we need to do. Um, and and we, we don't let the projects drive the process anymore. We, we continue to work off of good planning where the, where the most important resources are and keep and and just try to stay on top of that because I, I would hate to see a big chunk of money being infused into having renewable energy projects and suddenly the train goes off the tracks and we're back 10 years, we go back 10 years uh, to the chaos that we were all facing. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. We see the DRCP implemented properly, but I think we have to be vigilant and careful and be proactive to make sure that we don't see folks asking like in two years for an amendment to the plan to add more land to, to for renewable energy development in inappropriate locations. So um, that's, that's something I think we all are gonna have to be very vigilant about. Amen. And the Public Land Renewable Energy Development Act as currently worded could create problems if it becomes law along those lines because it- yes. It, 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 it tries to emphasize variance areas which, and defines them very broadly. So it could reopen the land rush that we were facing over a decade ago, as you point out, and that would be a shame. Yeah. Which is yeah. the reason why and, Republicans, some Republicans supported it. Correct. Correct. Yeah. 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 
So, and then the other thing we have to look at, and this is not this is more in the weeds, but you know, um, there's state lands that are scattered throughout the, the the DRECP area, and I think we need to be looking carefully about like where those lands are being bundled up for exchange and where projects get put, you know, on state lands and make sure that it's consistent with the conservation vision that was driving the desert renewable energy conservation plan. So these are, that's not a federal issue, but it, it could imp impact, you know, the conservation gains that we made um, through the DRECP. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you guys so much. Um, and thank you for making that additional point, Kim. Um, we do have a few more minutes for questions and I see a couple questions in the chat. Seth, I know you were monitoring the chat. Um, I've yeah, been good. as well, and it looks like we only have a couple questions. So if other folks want to ask questions, please raise your hands or type in the chat. Um, Seth, do you wanna curate our, our chat questions? Uh, yeah, sure. The first one is from Susie Boyd and she asks, how might California desert protection fare around the 30 by 30 initiative as protected desert already constitutes a significant percentage of protected land in the state? Uh, I'll dive in just to say that, you know, what I said before, and Kim and David can contradict me or clarify if they want, but I do think that um, most of the focus will be outside the desert, but things that can be done in the desert would be in holding acquisition through the Land and Water Conservation Fund, since we have mandatory spending. And I think uh, the Antiquities Act may be used to designate some more lands. And then the other thing is there could be uh, an effort to reinstate uh, or, or finally promulgate a solicitor's opinion regarding um, the implementation of public law 11111 and the establishment of the national conservation lands to try and make those more durable. We would always make the argument that that was a one-way street, one-way valve, you know, that the, the authority, like the Antiquities Act, the authority to designate was delegated, but not the authority to de-designate. And, you know, maybe we can solidify that, although it might take congressional action, and David has been working mightily on that. Uh, for a while, but we'll at least have, I think, a friendly administration in that regard. So those are the three things I think might happen in the desert to help implement 30 by 30 Antiquities Act, in-holding acquisition, and maybe clarification of the NCL uh, lands status. Great, great. Our second question is from Joan Taylor, and she wondered, um, what is the likelihood of another stimulus like in 2008 and the resultant solar gold rush in the desert? California's 100% clean energy by 2030, plus electrifying transportation will create an enormous demand, perhaps outstripping development focus areas capacity. Uh, I, I'll take that one. I'll start, other people. Uh, this is why I was talking about the being vigilant in the desert. It is, I am absolutely certain we're going to see another big push for uh, renewable energy projects because California has very aggressive goals, which is a good thing. The, the big issue is like where you put them. I mean, that's the big, big issue. Um, there's also issues about like how much rooftop versus a, you know utility in the mix and all that. But, you know, Nature Conservancy has done some really good analysis of this. The PUC, the California Public Utilities Commission, you know, the estimate is that in order to meet California's goals, we're going to have to uh, develop anywhere between 600,000 and over a million acres of land to convert to renewable energy projects. And so that's an enormous amount of land conversion occurring in a relatively short period of time when you consider that California's urban and suburban footprint is only 5 million acres. So we're talking about, like, about a massive type conversion. And again, if we're not vigilant about making sure that the process is set up in a way that we're driving these projects into the right areas, like for example, into the Central Valley where the groundwater um, sustainability work is going to end up with a large amount of land retirement we could be taking lands that are already just impacted and converting them into growing electrons instead of breaking new ground, you know, our habitat areas. So that's going to be a big area of work. And so I, for sure, that's going to happen. There's, if we're to meet our green energy goals, we're going to see a big push for more projects for sure. 
Yeah, I would add, I mean, everything that Kim said is right. And in terms of like the broader concept of what a, a future economic stimulus bill looks like when we're finally getting out of the COVID haze, my group and others are trying to urge Congress and will urge the next administration to not only focus on that, that Kim spoke about, but also to look for, uh, you know, conservation core type work and public land stewardship job growth as an economic driver. Um, and that's for everywhere in the West, including in California. But the idea that, you know, in a sense, New Deal era type ideas for how you generate jobs are you need the jobs, but you also need restoration of landscapes. That's why the Great American Outdoors was passed and the Land and Water Conservation Fund was fully funded. The funding is there. And now you need the opportunity to create the jobs and it's there. So hopefully some of that focus will be shifting to that type of work rather than just, you know, putting solar energy everywhere. Thank you. Um, this next one's from me. And I wondered if there's been any discussion uh, in the Biden transition team or agencies about um, what constitutes protected lands under 30 by 30? Is it multiple use lands? Is it only lands with a certain standard? What, what, what constitutes protected lands under 30 by 30? Mark, you want to, I, I, I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure what the Biden team thinks about that. I think they've been, I think they've been purposefully vague. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's all TBD. Yeah, it's TBD. Yeah. Um, I, I, like I said, well, when our governor made his announcement about his executive order on biodiversity and climate resilience, which included 30 by 30, he mentioned farmers and ranchers. So their working lands had a role in that. Not as big a role for working lands in the desert. You know, they're, those are being retired. There's really not a good sure. way to maintain that use probably, but sure. definitely elsewhere. So it's unclear. I mean, the global effort uses a couple of different IUCN categories. Uh, how they translate into our land management designations is not always clear. So it's, uh, it's fluid. The, you know, um, this came up when we were working on the uh, bill in, in the state legislature, AB 3030. I mean, my, my looking at the IUCN designations and sort of thinking about what it really should be. I mean, my perspective is that you've got sort of three categories that you have to look at. You have to look at the durability of the designation for the conservation. So it sh in my mind, it should be long term, you know, permanent conservation so that you're not trying to figure out what your 30% is on an Etch-a-Sketch, which means that, you know, like 30, 10 years, in 10 years, something disappears and now you gotta go find it somewhere else to add up to 30. Um, the other issue is, is that the primary management driver for that particular land that you're looking at as the protected area has to be for biodiversity conservation. The whole point of this is to conserve biodiversity. That's why we're doing the 30%. So, you know, that means that there'll be some public lands that are under multiple use mandate that are not going to qualify because they're not going to be primarily managed for biodiversity conservation. Um, and then there was a third one. Now I'm having a senior moment. But those were sort of, to me, those are two very important durability of designation and what the management aspect of it is. And if you can meet those two things, then I think you can qualify as a protected area. The other thing I would just make and that is, I think we have to be really careful that we don't fall into the, ha into the trap of trying to jam all of our conservation priorities into 30 by 30. 30 by 30 was identified as a minimum requirement in order to stem the massive tide of extinction that we're facing and to create climate resiliency. But quite frankly, we need to have a much broader matrix of lands. And this is where I think, land this is where I think working lands in particular has a much bigger role to play. And that is, those lands may not meet the definition of protected under 30 by 30, but if you're looking at long-term climate resiliency and, cli and, and reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to need lands that are managed appropriately um, that have benefits for biodiversity, but may not check all those boxes. It's to, so it's, um, I just be care, I just, you know, want to be careful that suddenly like all every, in order for our, you know, pr conservation priorities to get any traction, you gotta sort of shove them into the 30 by 30 box. I think that deletes what the point of 30 by 30 is. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. No, go ahead, dude. Yeah, I, well, just I think that's all well said. And I think that, um, you know, wildlife corridors, movement corridors, working lands play a really big role there. 
and you're going to need that. You can't have just a bunch of reserves that are isolated, and there's no way you're going to protect enough land in a very high level of protection to preserve all the corridors. That's just not politically or fiscally feasible. So I do agree with everything Kim said. Um, you know, 30 is great start, and then let's continue to do all these other things as well. And I just right. want to add, to be able to do any of what was just discussed, you need the largest land manager for the United States, the BLM, which has a multiple use mandate, re rejiggering how it thinks about multiple use in Bruce Babbitt's vision of a conservation focused agency. And so to kind of wrap this in, the, I saw Claudia's question about, we don't know who the next interior secretary will be, but most of the people who are being talked about, I think have a fundamental understanding and will be driven by the president's mandate that BLM obviously is still gonna to continue to do certain things like grazing and extra extraction, but it should be primarily focused on land conservation, whether it's the national conservation lands or any other lands they manage. If that's not done, you can't reach 30 by adding the, the, the acres up. Yeah, the key thing there is um, I think zoning. I mean, you can't do everything on every acre. So a lot of times you run into folks who say, well, multiple uses is man our mandate. Well, you can't do every use on every acre you own. You gotta do some things some places and then other things other places. And just getting people to get used to that and then have their conservation areas in the mix of their matrix, uh, that's a breakthrough. Um, yeah. I think they're evolving toward that, but they're not yeah. quite good. Well, that's where I think, you know, what putting aside, I mean, that, I'm not saying the DRECP is the be all end all, and there's definitely warts associated with that plan, but driving, driving management through a conservation strategy and creating and having that be, you know, landscape scale planning and conservation planning is the way we need to be proceeding. Um, it's hard and it takes time, but at the end of the day, it really um, will save us, I think, a lot of headaches. All right, well, thank you all. Uh, let's go to our last question. Is there a, you know, one um, person who's probably favored for the Secretary of Interior position? This, this question's from Claudia Saul. Well, Deb Holland is the Native American Congresswoman and David was discussing that up front, so I'll hand it over to him. I did see something where it said that the governor uh, of New Mexico, Lujan Grisham, had been offered the job but declined it. Um, yeah. What's clear is that whoever it is will be from New Mexico because all the names on the short list are from New Mexico. Um, but yeah. go ahead, David. Yeah, she, Governor Lujan Grisham, apparently wants to be Health and Human Services Secretary. Godspeed on that. Um, yeah, it, it the, there's been a few names floated around, but uh, retiring New Mexico Senator Tom Udall, current Senator uh, from New Mexico, Martin Heinrich and Congresswoman Deb Holland. And I mean, they'd all, I think, do an incredible job in that role. They all have, they're all conservation champions, but I think, you know, Deb Holland would be, uh, that would be a watershed appointment on a lot of levels, obviously the first Native American cabinet member, um, but to have a Native American person leading the agency that's responsible for everything dealing with Indian country, as well as public lands, which were originally all first American lands, uh, that would be historic. And I think she'd bring an, an unbelievably unique perspective to it. Um, but at, at the core of kind of the, the policies we've been talking about, she introduced the 30 by 30 resolution in the house. She led uh, the Antiquities Act of 2019 to restore all the monuments. Uh, so she, even though she's only been in Congress for a couple of years, she's really sharp on these issues. And so I think she'd be great on conservation and she would certainly be uh, long awaited leadership on tribal issues. Yeah. Great, thank you. If I had to bet my own money right now, I'd bet on her. So would I. That's, that's a pretty I'd bet David's question. money on her too. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, and thank you for giving us a little extra time. Um, we're at 639. Thanks to our audience for sticking with us. I, I think maybe we were having some fun there getting into discussion, um, which is great. 
Uh, with that, I want to introduce, we'll, we'll close the program, and I want to introduce our newest board member, Yanina Aldao Galvan. She is a, a fellow Argentinian, um, and she's going to close us out. And I'm going to share my screen again so that she can close us out. Thank you, Mariana. Um, well, and um, thank you for, to our audience and to our speakers. And um, on behalf of our board of directors, uh, I want to express our gratitude for you to be attending tonight. David, Mark, and Kim, thank you again for giving us your time and your expertise. And as always, we appreciate any support that you can give the California Desert Coalition. So yes, this is the selling point, the part where we pitch in for a little bit of money. So none of us are paid this is a 100 percent volunteer effort so if you like this program and you want to see more uh please donate and because we assure you that every single cent that you donate is 100 percent dedicated to programs like this and advocate advocating for issues that protect the california desert tonight we are launching our end of the year donation drive Please consider giving the gift of desert conservation for yourself, friends, and family to support our work in the new administration. Visit our new website, uh, californiadesertcoalition.org, so CA, it's right there, desertcoalition.org slash give. And um, we will continue to add resources and projects. We're still working on the website, so please follow us on Facebook as well for timely updates. And for more information, you can email us to info at desertcoalition.org. And with that, we wish you happy, healthy holidays and look forward to doing this again in the new year. Good night, everybody. Thank you all so much.